Good evening, everyone. Certainly good to see everyone, everyone here this evening, uh, here to, to praise our Lord, learn from his word, uh, fellowship together. A lot of that going on. Our first song will be number 134. Number 134. My favorite song, so I always start with this one. Okay. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. That's right. That's, it. That's it. what I love about leading singing is I do get to sing my favorite songs. Okay. Let's sing the song. Encamped along the hills of light, ye Christian soldiers rise and press the battle ere the night shall veil the glowing skies against the foe in veils below. Let all our strength be hurled. Faith is the victory we know that overcomes the world. Faith is the victory Faith is the victory, oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. His banner over us is love, our sword, the word of God. We tread the road, the saints above, with shouts of triumph trod. By faith they like the whirlwind's breath swept on o'er every field. The faith by which they conquered death is still our shining shield. Faith is the victory, faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. To him that overcomes the foe, white raiment shall be given. Before the angels he shall know his name confessed in heaven. Then onward from the hills of light, our hearts with love aflame will vanquish all the host of night in Jesus' conquering name. Faith is the victory, faith is the victory, oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. Our song before the opening prayer will be number 781. 781. Wonderful story of love. Wonderful story of love. Tell it to me again. Wonderful story of love. Wake the immortal strain. Angels with rapture announce it. Shepherds with wonder receive it. Sinner, oh, won't you believe it? Wonderful story of love, wonderful, 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 wonderful story of love, wonderful story of love, though you are far away. Wonderful story of love, still he doth call today, calling from Calvary's mountain, down from the crystal bright fountain, in from the dawn of creation. Wonderful story of love, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful wonderful story of love wonderful story of love jesus provides a rest wonderful story of love for all the pure and blessed rest in those mansions above us with those who've gone on before us, singing the rapturous chorus, wonderful story of love, wonderful, 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 wonderful story of love.
Would you join me in prayer, please? Holy Father, we thank you for this opportunity we have to get together this evening, study your word, sing praises to you, and fellowship when we can. And Lord, we thank you for this beautiful day you've given us. We thank you for all the blessings that you give us each day. And Lord, we thank you especially for Jesus. Without him, we have nothing to look forward to. Thanks to him, we have eternal life to look forward to. And Father, it's in his holy name that I pray. Amen. The Lord's Supper has been left prepared or prepared for those who are unable to partake this morning. Um, we'll do that after we sing number 687. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know the saith the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust his cleansing blood. Just in simple faith to plunge me neath the healing, cleansing flood. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I prove him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, Oh, for grace to trust him more. I'm so glad I learned to trust thee, precious Jesus, Savior, friend. And I know that thou art with me, wilt be with me to the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. If you would like to be served the Lord's Supper, please raise your hand as we come down the aisle and we will serve you. Let's pray together. Our God and Father, we thank you very much for our lives and every good and perfect gift. We know, we know it comes down from you. And Father, we thank you most of all for Jesus and the sacrifice that he made for us when he gave himself for us on the cross. We thank you for the precious forgiveness that comes through his blood. Help us to remember him, Father, as we take these emblems which represent his body and his blood. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
Let us pray again. Our great Heavenly Father, we thank you for our lives and thank you for every blessing. We thank you, Father, for Jesus who died for us. Help us to remember him, Father, as we take this fruit of the vine, which he said was his blood, the blood of the covenant, which we shed for many for forgiveness of sins. In his dear name we pray. Amen. If you want to mark the, the song, the song after the, um, the lesson this evening will be number 48, Anywhere with Jesus. Before the lesson, we're going to sing number 208, He is Able to Deliver Thee. Tis the grandest theme through the ages rung. Tis the grandest theme for a mortal tongue. Tis the grandest theme that the world e'er sung. Our God is deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. Though by sin oppressed, go to him for rest. Our God is able to deliver thee. Tis the grandest theme in the earth or main. Tis the grandest theme for a mortal strain. Tis the grandest theme, tell the world again. Our God is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. Though by sin oppressed, go to him for rest. Our God is able to deliver thee. Tis the grandest theme, let the tidings roll to the guilty heart, to the sinful soul. Look to God in faith, he will make thee whole. Our God is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. Though by sin oppressed, go to him for rest. Our God is able to deliver thee. Your scripture comes from Judges. Chapter 2, verses 16 through 23, NIV. Then the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of these hands of these raiders, yet they would not listen to the judges, but prostituted themselves to other gods and worshipped them. They quickly turned from their ways of their ancestors who had been obedient to the Lord's commands. Whenever the Lord raised up a judge for them, he was a judge and saved them out of the hands of their enemies as long as the judge lived. For the Lord relented because of their groaning under those who oppressed and afflicted them. 
But when the judge died, the people returned to their ways, even more corrupt than those of their ancestors. Following other gods and serving and worshiping them, they refused to give up their evil practices and stubborn ways. Therefore, the Lord was very angry with Israel and said, because this nation has violated the covenant I ordained for their ancestors and has not listened to me, I will no longer drive out before them any of the nations Joshua left when he died. I will use them to test Israel and see whether they will keep the way of the Lord and walk in it as their ancestors did. The Lord had allowed those nations to remain. He did not drive them out at once, but giving them into the hands of Joshua. that was it's especially for all of those folks who have been uh, with a smile on their face making that uh, uh, comparison or that uh, connection with this new hurricane that made its way uh, someone informed me that this new hurricane that's named Larry I never thought I'd name a, hear a hurricane after named after Larry but uh, someone told me yeah it's just a bunch of hot air you know <laughs> said thanks a lot but you will notice, if you happen to have read the news, that that hurricane has gone all the way up and is going to drop tons of snow on Greenland, where there's hardly any people. So I didn't bother anybody in populated regions. just wanted you to know that. I also wanted you to, to remember, you heard those words about judges, and as we continue this series in Judges, uh, when we think of a judge, we often think of someone sitting in a black robe behind uh, that, uh, you know, the, where the judges sit, on the bar or wherever they call that. Uh, we're talking about deliverers here. They're called judges, but basically we're talking about deliverers that God chose to deliver his people from oppression, and then, uh, well, they chose to follow or not. But it's always interesting when we're looking at these stories and other stories in history in general it's always interesting to see how man, when he's left to his own, seems to just self-destruct. Isn't that the truth? We wander away from God. In our introduction last week, we saw how Israel chose the path away from God time and time again. We saw how the people of God had compromised. Well, you know, God didn't really mean what he said when he said, cast out all of the nations before you inhabit that land. You know, it's not going to hurt to have a few in there. We can keep them as slaves, after all. Uh, they compromised, they conformed eventually to the nations around them, accepted their gods, intermarried with them. That was against what God had said. And they were content. They were fat and happy. Israel was doing well when we came to this point in history. Uh, they were free from the, as we saw in the very beginning of the book, they were free from oppression. They had land. Remember God promised them all of that time uh, when he was talking about that promised land. I'm going to give you a land with houses you didn't build, fields you didn't till. He didn't say that. Orchards you didn't plant. But uh, all of this stuff, it's like just move in, walled cities that were already there. And they could just take it over, throw out the people, and inhabit those places. Wow. Pretty good. Things couldn't have been much better at that point. Think about it. Many of this generation that inhabited the land had seen God work firsthand. They'd seen his miracles. They'd seen how he did those things. And, you know, the, although most of those who came out of Egypt, all of those actually who came out of Egypt uh, died, but along the way, those generations, they saw God. They saw God work. They saw God defeat. They saw God overthrow those nations that they thought were too big for them, the giants. Uh, they had experienced that generation, the, the wonderful, powerful leadership of Joshua and all of the elders that were around him, uh, but still they compromised, and they conformed, and they were content. They were fat and happy. When we get to Judges chapter 2, we're talking about passing the torch to a new generation. And that's when things go downhill really fast. Really fast. And that's why I entitled this lesson, Sailing a Sinking Ship. Because when we get to, by the time we get to the end of chapter 2 and into chapter 3, 
the ship is sinking, okay? And the leadership has failed them time and again. We read that passage last week, and I want to begin tonight. We read chapter 2 and verse 10 last week. After that whole generation had been gathered to the ancestors, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. But I want to start in chapter 2 and verse 1 tonight, if you've got your Bible. Uh, and I want us to imagine the scene that's taking place there, because it's really an interesting picture. Israel is scattered to all of their different places. Not a huge country, but still you're traveling on foot or by donkey. Uh, and so for all of them to come together was a big deal. Okay, Chapter 2 and verse 1, the angel of the Lord, we're going to come back to that in a minute, went up from Gilgal to Bochim and said, I brought you out of Egypt and led you to the land, and I swore to your ancestors, and I said, I'll never break my covenant with you. And you shall not make a covenant with the people of this land, but you shall break down their altars, and yet you have disobeyed me. Well, isn't that interesting? Why have you done this, God says, or the, the angel of the Lord says? I've also said I will not drive them out before you. They will become snares for you, and their gods will become snares for you. Uh, when the angel of the Lord had spoken these things, listen to this, to all the Israelites. There's a large group of people there. Thousands of people, when the angel of the Lord had spoken all of these things to the, all the Israelites, the people wept aloud, and they called that place, place Bochim. And there they offered sacrifices to the Lord. Chapter 2 and verse 6 is going to go on and say, After Joshua dismissed the people, they went to take possession of the land. Well, right in chapter 2 and verse 1, the angel of the Lord, we studied this before a couple of years ago. We had a Sunday evening a lesson on the angel of the Lord and where we see him in the Old Testament and, and who he was. Seems to be a very special angel, the angel of the Lord. Not just a, your typical angel mess, messengers, but someone special, uh, often in human form. Some people have gone so far as to say Jesus was the angel of the Lord and that he came in human form even before he came, was born of Mary. Uh, that's of course, probably possible. But what's interesting is uh, all the references to the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament. And uh, we'll come back to this one right here. But think about, for instance, Moses in front of the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3. The angel of the Lord spoke to him. In chapter 3 and verse 2. In chapter 3 and verse 4, it says, The Lord. In chapter 3 and verse 5, it says, God said. All of those referring to the same utterances coming from the mouth of the angel of the Lord. That's interesting. In Judges, we find an interesting connection to the Judges or the angel of the Lord. And I started at the back of, of Judges again, starting in chapter 13. Now, I don't know if you remember Judges 13. That's talking about Samson. You remember the angel of the Lord came down and talked to Samson's parents. Okay, you're going to have a child. Scared him to death. It would have scared me too. Uh, angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the father of Samson said, well, what's your name? And the angel of the Lord said, well, why do you ask my name? It's beyond understanding. Uh, later, Samson's dad says, we're doomed to die because we've seen God. Well, Gideon, in the case of Gideon, in chapter 6, uh, in verses 14, 16, 21, or 23, and 25, the angel of the Lord is identified as the Lord. It's an interesting study. And then in our text, notice what it says. Chapter 2 and verse 1, Judges, the angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal and said, I brought you out of Egypt and led you into the land I swore unto your ancestors. I said, I will never break my covenant with you. Isn't that interesting? Uh, an aspect of angel the angel world that we really don't know all that much about it. But what we see here is God speaking to his people and obviously he's not happy. Okay? He reminds them of how he had always kept his promises. I'll never break my covenant. He reminds them of how they had broken covenant with him so many times. You disobeyed me. Why did you do this? Why did you do this? God said. And he promised them that those people that had been left in the land that they didn't cast out would become traps and snares for them. The people's reaction, you saw that. Verse 4, when the angel of the Lord had spoken these things, the people wept aloud. They knew they had broken the covenant. 
They knew they had done wrong. And the people wept aloud and they called the place Bochim and there they offered sacrifices. Maybe they thought they could, well, maybe they can win his favor back by offering a bunch of sacrifices. I don't know, maybe they can appease him. After they left, they went to take possession. And it's interesting what it says. Uh, after verse 6, after Joshua had dismissed them, they went to take possession. And in verse 7, the people served the Lord throughout the t- lifetime of Joshua and the elders who outlived him. All those who had seen all the great things the Lord had done for Israel. Joshua dies, and then we have that famous verse 10. The next generation didn't know God. Let's focus on that just for a few moments. A whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors. It's Joshua's generation. Another generation came up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done. They didn't know the Lord. They didn't know the Lord's word. They didn't know what the Lord had told them. And I couldn't help but think of the practical 21st century uh, aspect of that, the importance of teaching the generations that come. I'm so thankful for Bible class teachers that we have here. We have a a lot of Bible class teachers. They're very dedicated to what they do, uh, dedicated to teaching the kids. Uh, But we forget something in our hyper-busy society, and that's parents, teach your children. It's your responsibility first. It's not the responsibility of those those young men and, and ladies or older men and ladies that teach in the back. Uh, in that other building they're doing a great service to us but it's your responsibility and I know I don't have a lot of parents in here tonight they're mostly over there but uh, I think grandparents have a responsibility as well go to extremes if necessary to teach your kids I know Luke is going to hit on this next Sunday morning in his sermon of bridging the gap Deuteronomy chapter 6 do you remember after God gave the law he says Impress these things on your children. Teach your children. Share them. Let them know why things are like they are. Make sure your children don't forget God. This generation didn't do that. Make every effort to teach your children. I don't often do this, but I'm going to do it tonight. Uh, I want you to open your songbooks, if you would, to 973 this is a relatively new song for some of us it's not a new song 1980 but uh, I like the text look around you'll find a songbook in there 973 don't typically lead songs in my sermons but I'm going to do it tonight I may get in trouble Who knows? Uh, what I'd like to do is to sing all three verses and then sing the chorus okay 973 God the Father, God in glory, miracles and mystery. Generations all adore Him, God the same through history. Lift the fallen, feed the hungry, God provides for everything. He is fair and full of kindness, saving those who call Him King. Awe-inspiring deeds of splendor, these proclaim His mighty power. Interwoven with compassion, gives us strength for every hour. Parents, tell your children, age to age the same. Glorify the living Lord above, magnify His holy name. Magnify His holy name. What a great thing to remember. Parents, teach your children. The second thing that we read in this passage, they didn't know God, they didn't know His Word, nor did they know what He had done. We just sang about that, those wonderful deeds that God has carried out. Well, parents, grandparents... Don't be afraid to tell your kids and your grandkids what God means in your life, how important He's been to you. 
uh, how, God, how good he is. Impress those things on them. We're one generation away from apostasy, one writer said. Well, if you switch down, jump down a little bit to chapter 3 and verse 1, you see the third thing that they forgot. Chapter 3 and verse 1, we read, These are the nations the Lord left to test all those Israelites who had not experienced any of the wars in Canaan. They forgot the Lord's word, they forgot the Lord's works, and they forgot the Lord's wars, the wars that God had fought. I'm thankful that we don't have to fight bloody battles to keep our homes and our families together. But we do fight battles, don't we? Spiritual battles every day. Our children need to know that. That we're not perfect, we make mistakes, we're fighting a battle every day against Satan. They need to know how God has worked in our lives, how God has given victory. Uh, we can't let our kids grow up in a, in a wealth-oriented society knowing that, not knowing that things aren't always going to be perfect and peaches and cream. They need to know what life is really like and that God has promised to be with us always. My question comes up, how can a nation have it so good that they forgot the source of everything. I'm not going to go there tonight. But we're there as a nation. This Israel was there. But it's so good. We have it so good that sometimes we forget the source of everything. Well, the passage that Chris read tonight begins in 2.16. Uh, and basically, that's where we start writing this cycle of disaster uh, that we've talked about. The Lord raised up judges. Israel sinned and rejected God. They were oppressed. They cried out. God sent deliverers, judges, that, who, that saved them from the oppressors, and things went well for a while. Downhill. <laughs> and then it all started again, the same cycle. And we see that throughout the book of Judges. <clears throat> Everyone, verse 16 we read it well we read that at the at the back of the at the back of the book last week everyone did what was right in his own eye verse 16 then the lord raised up judges to save them out of the hands of the raiders they couldn't win any battles god wouldn't let them win battle god gave them over verse 14 into the hands of raiders enemies all around them and they were in great distress they called out and god sent judges so before we look at a couple of those judges in chapter 3 uh, tonight, I want to look at three, actually. Uh, I want us to think for a moment and, and ask ourselves a question, what, what's the purpose of strong leadership? I mean, we don't, we're not in a forum where we can all answer out loud. Maybe we'll do that sometime. But think about that for a moment. What's the purpose of strong leadership? I think in this case and in our case, number one, it's to keep reminding us of who we are, where we've come from what we have with God. Maybe secondly, to keep us from making those self-destructive de uh, decisions that destroy our lives and the lives of, and of our people around us. Maybe thirdly, to keep us focused on God, the source. Because without good leadership, we tend to lose direction, don't we? We lose hope. When we look at those leaders <laughs> that God, we call them judges or deliverers, when we look at them, it's easy to to just break out and laugh. What was God thinking? What was God thinking with Othniel and Ehud and Shamgar and, and Samson and Gideon, all of these strange misfits, if you want to look at it that way? And yet God used them. We talked about that last week, that one of the main things in Judges is for us to, to, to think, God can even use me? That's a joke. Some of us would think that's a joke. I don't have anything that God can use. But yes, you do. Every one of us is gifted in certain ways. God makes it clear in Scripture that he sees the whole of man, not just the outside. And he can use the most inept of men and women. He can use the weakest vessels for good. And that's a beautiful thing. That's a beautiful thing. So let me ask a couple of questions. If you were in the business so a lot of you are in business or were in business. You wanted to fill a position. What would you do? Well, 
you'd go to a headhunting agency and you'd give them a list of all of those qualifications that you wanted and, and they'd look for somebody. Or you'd, excuse me, bring in applicants that fit all of those descriptions. Uh, you wonder if God did that. I guess he did. He knew what he was doing. Imagine if you were as a church looking for a preacher or a youth minister. Well, you're going to have a list of things you're looking for. Typically, what kind of criteria would you use? A church was in need of a preacher, and you may have read this somewhere before, but uh, they've been looking for some time, but they had a lot of trouble because every preacher candidate that they brought in, uh, somebody would gripe. You know, oh, I don't like this about him, or I don't like the way he does this, or I don't like his preaching, or I don't, you know, on and on it went. They seemed to find fault with every preacher that came in, and they were rejected, okay? A lot, most of them were rejected when they read the resume. That was enough. Some didn't have enough experience. Some had too much. Some not enough education. Some too much, and so on. Well, one day, one of the men on the search committee decided that uh, he was getting really tired of that, so he decided to do something. So he got up in the pulpit one Sunday and announced that they had gotten a new resume that week. Okay? And uh, so... Everybody sat back, folded their arms. He was going to read it to them. And they were ready to listen, ready to kind of look and see what faults this guy had so they could just reject him. Well, he read this letter. Dear church members, I'm writing to apply for your position as preacher. My experience is more along the lines of evangelist, but I believe I could fill your position adequately. I've never attended any Bible school per se, but I do have a lot of field experience don't have a degree on my wall, or I don't even have a wall for that matter. I've traveled around most of my life renting and doing odd jobs to support myself, preaching wherever I was invited, and churches and streets and even jails. As a matter of fact, I've been thrown in jail several times. Been involved in a few public squabbles. I've been accused of being anti-Semitic, being accused of being a rabble rouser, a few names I don't care to mention. There have been a few conversions to Christianity during my ministry as well as a few healings but for the most part I don't even remember who I baptized or if I baptize anybody thank you for considering my application well you can imagine how the congregation responded when they heard that they uh, there were smirks all over the place and finally one man just stood up and started laughing and asked the deacon yeah, does this guy really expect us to seriously consider him for our position what's this fellow's name anyway you guessed it, didn't you? Signed the Apostle Paul. Well, you could have heard a pin drop. You mean God can use somebody like that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, in the context of chapter 3, Israel had sinned. Uh, go figure. Israel had sinned, and so God sent him an oppressor. A Mesopotamian lemur, a uh, lemur, a Mesopotamian leader, king, known by the name of Kushan Rishitim, chapter 3 and verse 8, which, according to scholars, means double wickedness. What a name. Double wickedness was the king that was leading this oppression of Israel. And they were in deep. And God... Verse 7, the Israels did, Israelites did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, forgot the Lord their God, served the Baals and the Asherahs. Anger of the Lord burned against Israel. He sold them into the, names of double, into the hands of double wickedness. King of Aram Naharim, to whom the Israelites were subject for eight years. But then they cried out to the Lord, and he raised up for them a deliverer, Othniel, son of Kenaz. Caleb's younger brother who served who saved them. Now that's interesting. Caleb's nephew, you remember Caleb? Remember the spies that went into the land and 12 went in and 10 came back and said, we can't take these people, they're like giants, we're grasshoppers. But Joshua and Caleb said, oh yes, we can with the Lord's help. That's the Caleb we're talking about. This is a Caleb who at 80 years old came to Joshua and said, where's my inheritance? Where's my land? I want the mountains. Give me the mountains. There's pretty strong people there. But I can overtake them with the Lord's help. This is the man who was the uncle of Othniel. Othniel came from good stock. 
Spirit of the Lord came on him. He became Israel's judge, went to war. And the Lord gave Cushan Rishhatim, king of Aram, into the hands of Othniel, who overpowered him. And the land had peace for 40 years. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. Next came the Moabites under King Eglon. What a name. King Eglon. They were oppressed. Israel cried out. And I'm not going to read all of the texts for time's sake. But God sent another deliverer. Go figure. A left-handed fella. Now, scholars kind of figure, well, how did Ehud get in to see Eglon so easily? Probably because his right hand was crippled. Most scholars think he had a withered right hand, and so he was left-handed. He learned to adapt. Interesting. Well, Ehud goes to the palace, uh, pays a tribute to King Eglon, respect, and then he tells Eglon that he has a special message from God for him. Well, wonderful. Eglon's probably a little egotistical, but uh, he didn't, what he didn't know is he had made a special sword, 18 inches long, uh, strapped it to his right thigh. It sounds like an episode out of what's that series, uh, Game of Thrones or something. I've never watched it, but I've heard about it. Well, Eglon is up in his upper chamber. He says, well, come on in. Servants are sent out, and he's alone in there with Ehud. And we know what the rest of the story is. I'm going to read it from the text. Ehud reached with his left hand, drew the sword from his right thigh, and plunged it into the king's belly. Even the handle sank after, in after the blade, his bowels discharged, and Ehud did not pull the sword out, and the fat closed in over it. Ehud went out to the porch, shut the doors of the upper room behind him, locked them. He escaped. When the servants came back, a while later, wondering why they hadn't been invited back in, uh, they found the doors locked and assumed that the king was relieving himself. Well, Ehud did it. God did it. Using a man like Ehud, God defeated the Moabites, and they had 80 years of peace. Moab was made subject. The last one we wanted to look at tonight, Shamgar, we read one verse about him in verse 31 in chapter 3. After Ehud came Shamgar, son of Anath, and we don't know anything about him except that he was quite uh, adept with farm implements. Okay, He was good with farm implements. He killed 600 Philistines with a cattle prod, an ox goad. <laughs> that's, uh, that's something for, for Marvel Comics, isn't it? Uh, I'm telling you, 600 men, Philistines, with an ox goad. Wow. Well, the message for us is pretty simple, I think. Whether, you know, it's not easy to accept, but it's pretty simple. Whether it's farm implements, in the case of Shamgar, uh, whether it's a small sword, in the case of Ehud, in the, in the hand of a, of a cripple, whether it's five smooth stones that you pull out of the brook, the jawbone of a donkey, God tends to work with the tools he's got to his, uh, available to him, doesn't he? Always with the desire and the plan that we realize the power comes from him ultimately, always. It's his power and not our own. Maybe you remember the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 and 31. They were having some ego problems, okay, in this church. Paul says, brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth, but God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one can boast before him. It's because of him that you're in Christ Jesus, who's become for us wisdom from God, that is our righteousness, our holiness, our redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. I've heard it all my life. Oh, I baptized this many people. 
Oh, I did, this, I did this many Bible studies. We went on a mission trip to India and we baptized a thousand people. I've heard that my whole life. People bragging about all of the wonderful things they've done. And very, very seldom did I ever hear the name of God mentioned in that. I think that says a lot to us. If you're going to boast about something, boast in the fact that God even uses somebody like me like us God can use us and do great things the song we used to sing years ago and I'm about to to bring this to a close in the harvest field now ripen there's work for all to do hark the master's voice is calling to the harvest calling you does the place you're called to labor uh, seem so small and little known it's great if God is in it for he'll not forsake his own little as much when God is in it Labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown, and you can win it if you go in Jesus' name. And when the conflict is ended and our race on earth is done, he'll say, if you've been faithful, welcome home, my child. Well done. Little is much when God is in it. Labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown, and you can win it if you go in Jesus' name. I like that. It's time to take inventory every day. It's time to take inventory of our lives and just say, what's God got to work with in my life? And never forget, little is much when God's in it. When we're in his hands, he can do a lot of good. Let's give him the glory and the honor. Amen? If you have a need tonight, I hope you'll express it while we sing the song together. Elton? Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go. Anywhere he leads me in this world below. Anywhere without him dearest joys would fade. Anywhere with Jesus I am not afraid. Anywhere, anywhere, fear I cannot know. Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go. Anywhere with Jesus I am not alone. Other friends may fail me, he is still my own. Though his hand may lead me over drearest ways, anywhere with Jesus is a house of praise. Anywhere, anywhere, fear I cannot know. Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go. Anywhere with Jesus I can go to sleep when the darkening shadows round about me creep, knowing I shall wake and never more to roam. Anywhere with Jesus will be home, sweet home. Anywhere, anywhere, fear I cannot know. Anywhere with Jesus I can say, go. Thank you for being back tonight. It's good to see everybody back, and especially would uh, like to welcome any of you that uh, might be visiting with us. We appreciate you coming our way, and, and I want to say hello to those out there that are listening in. Appreciate you uh, tuning in tonight. Thanks, Larry, for that uh, wonderful lesson, and uh, I guess this is your last night for a while, huh? Here anyway. Uh, Larry, as you know, is going to be leaving uh, tomorrow to go to, uh, um, where are you going to? Um, Austria. You told us this morning I've done for God. So. Austria and then to Germany and uh, then Pam will be joining him later. So we want to uh, wish Larry Godspeed on his uh, journey and much success. Uh, pray that God will use him in mighty ways as he uh, ministers to the church of uh, refugees in those countries so have no prayer cards let's go to God in prayer and we'll be dismissed thank you God for everything you do for us thank you for all the many blessings that you bring to us we're 
so grateful, Heavenly Father, for the way you love us and, and the way you take care of us and the things that you provide us with. And we uh, love you and we are grateful that you love us and that you provided Jesus to provide for us a way to salvation and, uh, and also to give us a, a more abundant life, a reason for living, a purpose. Father, we pray that you would be with us as we leave here tonight and, and uh, watch over us until we come back together again. Keep us all safe and healthy and, and uh, use us in whatever way you see fit, Heavenly Father, and help us to be willing to be used and to look for ways that we can serve you and bring glory to your name. Pray that you'll be with Larry as he travels to uh, Austria and Germany, that you will bless him in the work that he's going to be doing there. And uh, we have some capable men that will be filling in for him while he's gone. We pray that you would bless them. and the things that they will be doing here. Thank you again for Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Before we go our separate ways, let's sing This World Is Not My Home. This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. They're all expecting me, and that's one thing I know. My Savior pardoned me, and now I onward go. I know he'll take me through, though I am weak and poor, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home then Lord what will I do the angels beckon me from heaven's open door and I can't feel at home in this world anymore I have a loving Savior up in glory land. I don't expect to stop until I with him stand. He's waiting now for me in heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Just up in glory land, we'll live eternally. The saints on every hand are shouting victory. Their song of sweetest praise drift back from heaven's shore. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Have a good evening. <laughs>